You're welcome back. It's time now to go to the papers and see what made the headlines this morning. Um, we're going to have as our guest this morning, Mr. Tunde Kolawole, who is a legal practitioner that always talks with us uh, from Lagos here. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolawole. Good morning, my brother. Hope you had a great night. Uh, yes, I had a great night. <laughs> I'm dragging the yes. I wanted to weigh uh, whether it is supposed to be yes or no, uh, because in, this, in these times, it's difficult. There was no light, and buying fuel that will take you for the whole night is a problem in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But I did sleep well, so we thank God for small messages. Welcome to Off the Press. <laughs> Okay, we're beginning our, our discussion on the headlines for this morning with the Guardian newspaper. The Guardian newspaper has a very bold headline there, Fear of sovereign debt defaults takes toll on banks, economic outlooks, and all that. It's, it's, it's something uh, that we are very, very interested in. Fear of sovereign debt defaults takes toll on banks and economic outlook. We are looking for an economy where we will improve in the next few months and make sure our reserves are, are very healthy, make sure that the people live a better life and all that. And now the banks that carry out a lot of financial activities that will define what a country's economic outlook is like are afraid because they might default on this foreign uh, sovereign debt. Now they're struggling uh, to do things. I'd like to hear your comments on these and tell us whether you think there is a solution to this or uh, there is something really, really good coming up uh, in the nearest future. Well, um, Nigeria has been very reckless in borrowing especially under the last uh, regime, such that almost all our earnings now goes into meeting our obligations to our creditors. And that is not too helpful for any economic uh, growth. <coughs> no economy grows when it is choking in debt. But ordinarily, the should have been some, uh, the, some lever, some restraint on the reckless borrowing that we saw during the last regime. The National Assembly that should have applied a break, the state, and the minister, the foreign, I mean, the finance ministers, who ordinarily should have cautioned the government with regards to all those accumulation of uh, debt. Even discharge their responsibilities, they will have many days should be discharged. But as to your question, whether there is a solution out of this, of course there are. Uh, if you read uh, some other parts of the paper this morning, you would have seen that uh, the federal government, under President uh, Ahmed Tinobu, has raised a panel to look at ways and means of improving revenue to be generated from taxes all over the country. That is a very good direction where the government is going. If the panel is able to come out with very, very crucial uh, initiatives and suggestions as to how to improve tax collection in this country, that would be one way that means of really being able to raise funds to pay our debts and make the country become healthier financially. The other area that I have always asked on is that the cost of contract in this part of the world, it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't happen like that in any other place. So we require to look at the cost of executing government contracts projects with view to cutting down all those things so that we can free some resources not just to pay our debt but to also 
invest in infrastructural development. The other area we could look at is uh, the Nigerian ports, the money coming from uh, petroleum, uh, from the petroleum sector, and then from customs. I have given this example before that during the civil war, when Chief of Afemiaulo was the finance minister and the, the prime minister, in quote, what he did was to see all avenues and opportunities for leakages at the ports, in customs, in the cocoa uh, industry, on the plantation and export of cocoa uh, things, and some of these other revenue generating uh, areas. We put credible men and women in charge of those places who were able to help him block all the leakages and also to raise the revenue uh, profile of those uh, arms of government. And with that, we were able to generate a lot of money, a lot of revenue to meet government obligations. Of course, too, we have always emphasized this, that the cost of governance is also too high. Say, for example, the present president, Mr. Ahmed Bola Tinubu, is now going to be having about 42 ministers. And then you begin to ask yourself, rather than cut down the number of ministers, why is he increasing their number? For every minister, you will be paying salaries and other emoluments. You will provide vehicles. You will provide accommodation. And all manners of sundry things. That pleases the economy. That pleases the revenue of the country. That doesn't all go well for prudence. And it also doesn't speak well before our creditors. Of course, you can also go to the National Assembly. One of the first things the National Assembly did was to allocate to itself about 70 billion naira, which they will use to buy vehicles, uh, change their wardrobes, and not provide accommodations for themselves. When almost about 90% of them do have their houses, their private properties in Abuja, where they will be living, and in a way, also be collecting rents for those properties. All these are areas the president could look at and find ways and means to reduce the expenses in that area. But if we are afraid of stepping on people's toes, of doing what is right, no creditor will take us serious. And we might not be able to pay some of the debt that is coming from these areas of uh, and sovereign wealth. And so many other areas, we are in so many other areas. The foreign airlines are being old. The World Bank is old. IMF is old. Little for some of these other lending nations. So these are some of the things that we could do to really be able to meet our obligations to our creditors. Okay, um, well, <clears throat> you have mentioned very beautiful things that need to be done. Uh, blocking of leakages and uh, so many other things that you mentioned. But one worrisome thing is when you talk about uh, increasing tax, um, money that comes from tax into the federal coffers, the fear is almost always that the people will be milked dry because of uh, uh, this move to make sure that the tax revenue increases. A, a case in point is Lagos State. For instance, the revenue of Lagos State moved up very, very high. Uh, but that necessarily wasn't because so many companies came into the place, so many uh, jobs were created, so many things were done. But so the things that brought in the, the money, as some people will argue, are things that the people themselves have to pay for and all that. The toll gate here, the, the taxes where you're selling your, your little wares and so many other things. Now, a critical point when you want to raise revenue is when there is a lot of employment 
that people get engaged so much, they make the money and then pay the tax. Another one is investment in the society. Is there a good um, investment climate in Nigeria at the moment that can attract a lot of investors into Nigeria that will raise this uh, revenue of Nigeria in the shortest possible time? Or are we really going to rely on the taxes or overtaxing the people of Nigeria in, in, in spite of the fact that there is so much suffering in the land right now. Do you think this is realizable, getting all these other things that you mentioned, uh, blocking the loopholes, re reducing the cost of governance, when you see, like you mentioned yourself, 70 billion given to less than 500 people, and so many other things that are happening right now. Do you think the, the, the government, like the president has said, is, is moving to end over-reliance on borrowing for public expenditure. Where will the money come from? Is it from Nigerians that are impoverished right now, or is the climate good enough, economic climate or the business climate good enough for people to come and invest from outside the country and so make us to make money? My point of departure will be reference to the letter that the Netflix semi Palano wrote to the president not too long ago about the humongous amount of money that some of the oil companies, some of the taxes, that some of these oil companies are not remitted to government. He also made reference to humongous amount of revenues that some of the banks have collected on behalf of government, which they are not remitting. And he argued in that letter that if the president or the government is able to get some of this money, it will go a long way in addressing the challenges of the debt that the country is uh, uh, owing all over the places. Why the president isn't making efforts in that area uh, baffles me a great deal. The second area I want to address is uh, the taxes you have talked about. There is no doubt about it that the average Nigerian person is already choking in taxes. There are multiple taxes all over the places. I will give you two examples. The federal government collects um, VAT value added tax. The local state government also collects the consumption tax. And you want to ask yourself, what is the difference between value added tax and then consumption tax, which the local state government is um, collecting? In my humble opinion, they are all uh, the same thing. You can also go to some of these other areas too, and you find that there are multiple taxations all over the place. And like you said, when the industries are not engaged in any productive activity, and when individuals are not employed, where do we expect them to get money to pay their taxes? That question is a very jamming one. But it is like, um, what comes first? The chicken or the egg? Without raising taxes, you cannot provide infrastructure. You cannot provide the other means to really ginger the industry to become productive. And if you also overtax the people, the possibilities are that the industries, their disposable income will shrink, if not totally collapse. So all these things have to be balanced so that we can have a middle of the road that will be comfortable, not just for the industry, but also for the individuals to be able to meet their obligations to government and for government to be able to provide the infrastructure and all the necessary facilities that will lead to creation of jobs, not just by the government alone, but also by the organized the private um, the sector. The area I also want to happen is that um, even these taxes that we are talking about, are they being efficiently collected? 
If you look at the mandate which the federal government, which Ahmed Bola Tinubu has given to the committee that he has set up, his emphasis is really on prudent collection of the taxes that are already on ground. If they are able to raise more taxes or advice on some other areas to generate taxes, it will be welcome. But the truth of the matter is that um, the taxes that are on ground today are not being efficiently and prudently collected. Most times, if you are following the activities of the National Assembly and some of these other government agencies and all that, you will find out that most of these revenue that are generated goes into lining the pockets of individuals. Look at the probe, the probe that is coming up in the National Assembly with regards to the Federal, I mean, Federal Character Commission. Look at the revelation that is coming from there. Also look at what the jam, the Joint Admission and Matriculation Board has been able to do. Before ISIAC, Professor ISIAC, uh, the man who is the DG of jam, got in there before. Jam used to go to government to get some money to carry out his activities. But since the man got in there, since the God fearing man got in there, he's not, able, he's not only able to generate revenue, to meet all the obligations of uh, Jam, but he's also paying a substantial amount of money into the coffers of the federal government. If we are able to replicate what is happening in Jam, in some of these other federal government agencies and other, you and I will see that even with the money that is coming to the federal government, that is coming to some of these state governments, with regards to revenue, is enough to manage this country efficiently and prudently, which will lead to a sustainable growth in all areas of our endeavor. But, but can this the be truth done? of the matter is that uh, can this be done? corruption has become endemic in this country, and until we rein in this corruption, we will just continue to accumulate debt. Yes, but be running around in can, can we rein in this corruption that you're talking about, uh, Tunde? Can we rein in the corruption that we are talking about? Knowing that, okay, let me give you an example as well. In the oil sector, yeah. you find out that they have been talking about subsidy, uh, subsidy money, lining the pockets of a few people. And I'm sure you and I know that uh, we know or they know the people whose pockets this money is lining. And nobody has been brought to book, exactly. even with the present administration. Exactly. So do you think this corruption can be reined in? Do you think cost of, cost of governance can be cut when all these things that are, still, that are happening are still happening till now? Do you think that all these solutions that you are proffering, and even the ones that Femi Falano also proffered, will be followed? Or it is just go tax them more? That will happen. But, um... It is not impossible uh, if the president would develop the political will and if he's ready to step on people's toes. I'll give one example. When Jaramuri Tala came into governance, I think about 1976, he became, he shot his way to, the, to become the military head of state. When he got there and we find out what was on ground, wasn't palatable at all. One of the first things he did is to give up all the wealth that he has unlawfully accumulated. He surrendered all the houses that he has built with proceeds of corruption. And after he did that, he asked all the federal ministers, all the governors, to do the same. And those who didn't do the same, he went after them confiscating the assets. What I'm drawing out of this is that uh, if, the present, if the people in government presently are ready to commit a class suicide with regards to all illegally acquired wealth, and they are also ready to step on each other's toes, it will be possible to really fight corruption the way it should be fought. And then uh, when you go back to the speech delivered by Mr. President during his inauguration, he has talked about fighting corruption. We hope and pray 
that will be committed to that solemn declaration that was taken that he made before all Nigerian people when he was being sworn in. Furthermore, he will recollect that uh, he has also said and set up a lot of committees to inquire into what has been happening at the Central Bank of Nigeria and some of these other revenue generating uh, organizations. But with that as it may, some of the things that we have also found happening under the present regime is very, very discomforting. He doesn't give anybody any um, a kind of assurance that the president will be able to work his talk. Say, for example, a ship was said to have been uh, apprehended carrying about 1 million metric tons of uh, petroleum products, which almost amounts to a daily production of the entire Nigerian uh, uh, products in the oil sector. And rather than confiscate that ship, sell the product, sell the ship, we were told that the ship was set ablaze and the product inside it uh, allowed to just dissipate into the Atlantic Ocean. A nation that is in this kind of a debt, a nation that desires to free some resources to be able to engage in development, will not do that. That action portrays us as a country of a prodigal, a kind of prodigal republic. So, the truth is, the president must be ready to step on people's toes if he wants to be able to raise resources to engage in all the developmental plans that this country requires to engage in. And let me say this, the opportunity in our hands today, the opportunity in the hands of President Bonamed Simbu might be the last opportunity that the Nigerian ruling class have to redeem their image and turn the economy and turn Nigeria around. If they fail, what we saw in the uprising against the Nigerian police will be a child's play. In fact, what I'm saying is fire next time. Mm. Okay, uh, well, stepping on toes that you just mentioned, is that one of the things that is happening now? Let's go to the Punch newspaper now, uh, where we have the report of a, a University of Ibadan a student making the list of this panel. Uh, one, one student, final 400 level student of economics has made his list of uh, the panel that uh, will be investigating this and putting things in order. And some people have said that, um, yes, it's a good thing that this is a sign that the youths are being carried along, that this uh, Agbaje has been uh, selected also to be a part of this panel. But Will that serve the purpose when you have people who are experts, people who are very professional in that field that could have been called upon to do uh, the needful instead of going to get a struggling student inside the university, she has not even graduated to be uh, a part of this panel. So what do you think about uh, what he has just done? My brother, it's a very, very good development. It's a very, very laudable appointment. You see, most times, when you talk to some of these young people, they are very, very intelligent. They are also highly exposed. The opportunities that they have now, we never had them. There is internet at their disposal, television all over the places, telephones in their hands, such that information is at their fingertips. Any serious-minded youth any serious-minded student who has access to all these facilities should be able to, co to contribute meaningfully in the kind of panel in which this girl has been inducted. The second one is that um, we must remember that the youth are the leaders of tomorrow. If we don't start grooming them early, the way President Bola Tinubu has started with this young girl, 
we might be jeopardizing our future. In fact, it could be tantamount to cutting our own noses in order to spite ourselves. So this guy is going there to learn. He's also going there to learn. He's also going to represent our consistency. And he's also preparing for the challenges of the future. So to that extent, I welcome what the president has done. And I will also enjoy the girl to discharge, her, to discharge the responsibilities. But do you think that a committee, she has a committee of this nature do you to, think... prove the, no, to prove the point yeah. that uh, the youth are capable, have the capacity to do some of these things? I, I, we must remember that the universities are in crisis. They are looking for ways and means to also improve their own revenue generating formula. And most times when the universities increase cookies, the students always go on protest. They go on rampage. With the induction of this guy to this committee, they came with the exposed to the revenue, to the money coming to the covers of government. And with her exposure, She'll be able to carry the message back to our constituency, which is the student uh, constituency, the university community. That this might not be as the students think it is. Because the average Nigerian student probably think the government has more than enough resources to invest in the university and they are not doing it. Uh, ju Tunde, just so a moment. Just a moment. The revenue of the country, ju just a moment, please. She might be able to. Just a moment, Tunde. Just a moment. Um, there are two things right. that have, there are two things that have come out from what you are saying, and I, I need some clarifications. Right. First of all, is that okay. um, you said it's going to be a good opportunity to learn for the girl, and yeah. I'm wondering, is a critical uh, committee like this fiscal policy and tax reform? Even though I know that Agbaje herself is uh, the president of the uh, tax club in her university and all that. But is this, uh, this committee, which is going to change the outlook of this nation, uh, a committee that somebody should go and learn inside it? And secondly, uh, you sounded like um, she, she is going to be groomed to become a mouthpiece for the government uh, when she's talking with the students, going back to her constituency, as you put it, and all that. So is it really going to be a critical uh, function that she's going to function in that place to make sure that the country becomes better? Or is she going to learn? And thirdly, let me just say this. Why not, if we need to groom the, our youths, make them these so-called um, ministers of state that really do not have functions that they do, but they can stay there and learn for the future so that they too can uh, be good enough to become ministers one day. Remember that the uh, Festus Keamo said the other time that it was not even supposed to be that position of minister of state. So why don't we use that to groom our youths instead of putting them in the critical positions that they will now start to go and learn before they function well the way they should function. I'm just, I'm just saying. Well, let, let me say this uh, quickly. I spent uh, about 27 years in journalism. And I've also been doing law practice now for about uh, 17 years. And you will not believe it that uh, any time I venture or ask us to go back to the area of journalism, I still find myself learning one or two things. Anytime I also go to court, I find myself learning one or two things on a daily basis. So there is no end to learning. The senior advocates are in court. Some very young people are very smart, who made first class and made two ones. They are in court, who are there to teach me new things. So all the people we have on that panel, we will also be going to that panel to learn, just like advantage. So, learning is not just for a budget alone, but for all the people in the panel, because what they will be exposed to are things that you ordinarily do not see on a daily basis. Take, for example, what is happening in the Federal Character Commission. Who would have thought that the Federal Character Commission was a bazaar where jobs are being held and sold by commissioners in that uh, commission? So, uh, grooming, 
uh, it's not out of place. In some of the states, especially in Lagos State, we have this uh, one day governor. Students who are doing well, they are given the opportunity to act as governor for Lagos State, and some of these other states for one day. The experience that those children will go through for that one day will inflame them and love them for the rest of their life. So to that extent, I think we should encourage what Mr. President has done and also continue to support him in the appointment of young people into his cabinet because the youth are the teachers of this country. Okay. Uh, let's break away from uh, talking solely Nigeria. Let's talk ECOWAS now. ECOWAS, uh, that's on Niger. ECOWAS plans fresh sanctions on Burkina Faso, Mali, UN talks fail. Uh, that's the story there on the Punch newspaper. And the writers are ECOWAS um, leaders meet on Thursday after botched AU, UN, US plant visit to Niamey. And then over 100,000 IDP stranded in Niger. Businesses grounded in Sokoto, Katsina borders. What are your comments on that? Sanctions, sanctions, sanctions on countries that have <laughs> military rules. And right now, a big superpower like Russia is giving handshakes to all these countries that have military rulers. So there's going to be an alignment moving away from the West to Asian countries, and that's what we're seeing. China is also trying to get a piece of the action. Russia is getting a piece of the action, and so many other countries might capitalize on that. So sanctions, sanctions, sanctions. Let's hear your comments on what is happening, the might of ECOWAS as regards the Niger conflict, and what you think they can achieve with all these their sanctions. My last bleach, when I see what is happening in some of these African countries, the space of military takeover in some of these African countries, it's a heart rendering. Honestly speaking, it is a monumental setback for us as a people that in the 21st century, some people, because they have access to AK-47 and bullets, who just shoot their way into power and impose themselves on us and then be pretending to be our messiah. Most part of Africa has been ruled for military men, by military men, for over 30 years. What benefit do they derive from their rulership? Nothing. Measure the development that has taken place in Nigeria between 1999 and this 2023. And related to what happened when the military were in power in Nigeria for about 30 years. You cannot compare, in spite of the corruption, we see initiatives, we see development, we see competition all over the face of the federation with regard to really moving the Nigerian uh, state forward. That we never saw under the military. So for anybody to now begin to pretend that he is a messiah, like the young boy in Burkina Faso is pretending, beats my imagination. It's not right. No matter how big and no matter what you are, the ballot and the uh, and the voter card should be the means of getting into power, and not otherwise. Let um, them discharge their responsibility after they've come to the army. Mr. Kolawole, they can retire and then go into politics. Uh, Tunde, well, as regards the. As regards the sanctions you're talking about, mm. sanctions have never worked anywhere. Sanctions have been imposed on Russia uh, since uh, it invaded uh, Ukraine. As it uh, crippled or brought down the government in there. Sanctions have been imposed on so many other countries around the world. But it has not led to the collapse of the government in there. Because like you said, some other countries want to take advantage of the sanction to sell their goods and services and also to step into the shoes of those who are imposing the sanction. So I'm not too sure that sanction is going to be efficacious, that sanction is going to solve the problem of military takeover in some of these African uh, uh, countries. 
I would have uh, advised or like to see the carrot and the stick uh, approach which President Paul Ahmed Inubu had planned to use before pressures uh, started mounting on him not to go to war in uh, Niger and some of these other countries. If Nigeria should put down the neck of uh, the junta's in Niger, in Burkina Faso and Mali and some of these other places, I have the feeling that the governments over there will collapse because they are still very fragile. But they won't be fighting this war. Nations. They won't be fighting this war alone. That's another thing you have to consider. Burkina Faso has uh, volunteered. Uh, Mali has volunteered. And I'm sure, okay, they have already signed a contract with Wagner of Russia, which means Russia is in the know, and they are ready also to give their manpower. So Nigeria or ECOWAS won't be fighting Niger. They'll be fighting um, a section of the people that is not just Niger. And then the collateral damage will be Nigerian at the border. How many other states border uh, Niger more than Nigeria? There are so many states in Nigeria. I agree with border. you. So well, now, let me quickly say this. Yes, quickly. When you look at some of those countries we are talking about, they already have problems with the jihadists in their respective countries. Like we do. And because of that, yes, like we too, they will not have the full complement of their military to engage equals in any serious fighting. Secondly, their economies are very, very fragile. Mm. Thirdly, I am not too sure that they have the support of majority of their population. Some of the crowds that you see demonstrating are probably rented crowds. People pay okay. to demonstrate in support of the music junta in those places. And then you must remember that uh, if an army is only effective where it is accustomed or familiar with the terrain in which it is fighting. The Wagner group, the Chinese, and then the Russia, if they come to the desert of Africa to fight, they are going to be defeated. They could be defeated by the Nigerian army and by the Air uh, army. All the fighting that they have been doing against the ragtag uh, jihadist army, in where have they defeated those ragtag army? America went to Afghanistan, it was under defeated. America, France, and Britain were in Vietnam. They okay. were under defeated. Okay. In fact, I would say the fight in Niger is an opportunity for the Nigerian army All right. to prove its worth in Africa. All right. Okay, um, this is where we we'll really have to wrap it up on this segment. We have even overshot. Uh, thank you so much, Tunde Kolawole, for coming on the program this morning. Thanks for having me. Okay. Do have a great day. You too. You too. Well, that was, to, that was Tunde Kolawole, legal practitioner, talking to us from Lagos here in Nigeria. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we'll be talking about other issues. Stay with us.